Folks can hear me now. Yes. Okay. If you're out there in online land, we're going to wait five minutes to get started. We have folks in our in our office here. Uh, we just wanted to turn on the meeting and get started. Um, you, you got the list, okay? So we're going to do the yeah, I'm going to be We've got a lot of attendees queuing up. Hey, Marla, someone's asked a question in the chat. Did you see that? And I can't hear anything in there. I suppose you have us all muted, right? Okay, thanks, Scott. We'll check it. All right. All right, folks, it's six o'clock. Um, we're in Miles City at the Fish and Wildlife and Parks headquarters. Uh, my name is Brad Schmitz, and I am the regional supervisor for this region. Um, I need to explain a little bit about how this evening is going to work. Um, we have in our meeting room members of the public, uh, Commissioner Lane. Um, I don't see any our CAC members. We have some staff members here. Um, uh, on online as well, we have at this point about 25 
people that are interested in, in listening and participating here. Um, so how our room is set up, what you see is me at this point and behind my computer, what you can't see online is, is the room full of, of folks that are here to attend this, the face-to-face -face part of this. So um, just a few little bit of housekeeping for the folks in the room here. It may be a little cool with our room, with our doors open. I apologize for that, but if we turn on our heater, then it blows like crazy and we can't hear. So I'd rather have it off and have you put your coats back on and be be able to hear each other comment as we go through here. Um, for folks online, here's here's the process. I'd like to can you hand me that book, please, Marla. What I'd like to go through this evening. Um, I'll do a, some quick introductions here, and then I want to kind of give you what our process is going to be, where we're at with this regulations process. Um, then I'm going to turn our time over to Brett Dorak, who's our wildlife manager here in Region 7, and he will go through the, the two things, statewide proposals that have been before the commission and have been thrown out towards the public now um, for comment, and then also the proposals that have been suggested that are on the table for public comment uh, that are associated or, or affect Region 7 wildlife management. So Brett will go over those things. Once we have done that and we have the opportunity for everybody to kind of digest what those, what those proposals are, then I want to have a question and answer opportunity um, for, for one specific purpose. It's always good to have that interaction, but our purpose tonight is to provide comments to the commission. Um, this is a little bit different this year than we've seen in years past. So if you've been in our process for many years, you're going to find it slightly different. First off with this online and in-person meeting. Uh, it's a little bit more logistically challenging for an old goat like me to try and figure out. So bear with us on that. Um, <coughs> when we get to our question and answer period, what I'll try and do just to maintain some consistency is work through this room first, have our conversations there. Uh, we'll repeat back so folks can hear that online. Then we'll go through our online folks that are there and make sure that they have an opportunity to be heard. And then we'll go around the circle again as many times as we need to to make sure that, that, that folks are heard. Again, I apologize to folks in the room for sitting behind a computer, but I need to do that for our folks that are out in the stratosphere here. So um, our purpose this evening, as I mentioned, is to collect comments um, and thoughts for the commission. Now, Brett will go over where you can do this. It's a little different. If you've been in years past, we've jotted down your comments. We've moved away from that um, because we found that what we interpret and write down isn't always what you say to us. Um, so uh, we've been instructed to ask you to go to our website, and Brett will show you where that is, and make sure that those comments are captured in your own voice and your own thoughts, in your own writing, so that all seven commissioners get to see them. Um, you know, Bill's pretty good to visit with as our local commissioner in Region 7. But if you, you know, if Bill just hears it, then you've missed six commissioners that need to also hear that, that may have those same com comments and concerns. So you'll hear me say this multiple times this evening, as I'll refer you back to where that point is on the website. Um, as you have specific comments, ideas, concerns, we need to have those listed in there so they're part of that entire body. Um, also with us, we have some CAC members this evening. Um, our Citizens Advisory Council consists of about a dozen folks. Um, they've, they've worked with us through this fall as we've gone through these iterations of, of our regulations process. Um, we've asked them to participate from a distance um, because they've had that interaction a little bit, but more so to save some bandwidth and, and provide some more public space for folks to be here. So they may have comments and questions as well as we get in this process. We'll run them through just like we do everybody else so that they, they have their voice and their, um, their, their opportunity to, to comment as well. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything there. I appreciate you being here. Um, any questions as far as mechanics before we turn this over to Brett and he goes through what this process is? Now, do you want me to talk about some of that history or you I can talk you about do that? History. Okay. I've got Ed Joyner with a hand up here. I don't know if he's... Okay, ask, see what Ed's okay. quick question is and we'll go from there. All right, Ed, did you have a problem with the Zoom program or something you needed to ask? Ed, 
Ed, are you with us online? He's there. He done Can you, you done unmute me. yourself? Which Ed are you talking to? You. Ed Joyner. <laughs> well, I messed up. I'm just here for the ride so far, so go ahead. <laughs> so you want us to put your hand down? Okay, thanks. Oh, it is up, but okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, Liz is the other one. Liz, did you have a question for us before we get started? Yeah, thank you. I'm um, just checking in. What other um, CAC members are either in the room or online besides Ed? <laughs> right now we have Andrew Wright, you, Liz McFarland, and Ed Joyner. I'm checking here to see if there's anybody else with us. Now, folks have the capacity to come in and come out on that online process. And so Marla's, I've asked Marla to kind of manage that process. So that's it right now, Liz. Okay, thank you. And thank you. one one other piece, then do I do you take me off or I do I do something on this, how this is set up? Either way, Liz, but I can go ahead and mute you if that was all you needed from us at the yeah. moment. Thank you. Now, for online folks, you're aware, Marla, Marla is the queen. She has ultimate control over this. So, so as we get to comments, like I said, I would go through the room first. Um, I want you to be able to hear that conversation, hopefully. I may answer a lot of your questions. Then we'll get to the online folks when we get to that point of our program. Um, and then Marla will turn you on and off as far as your ability to speak so that we can maintain this flow. So appreciate your patience with that. Again, I'll turn our time over to Brett. Um, he'll, he'll throw his stuff up on the screen. You'll be able to see it over my head on the TV. Um, and I want you to speak loud enough so that folks online can hear. Sure. All right. For those of you online um, and here in the room, once again, my name is Brett Dorak. Wildlife manager here in Region 7. Um, please raise your hand if there's any issues with the screen sharing, but we'll get through this. And then uh, we'll have questions at the end. Uh, for those of you online, you might hear me referring to people here in the room about a packet that I've handed out. Um, I'll show you where all those information oh, uh, sheets are available online. They're on the same website where you can comment. It's just for ease of reference uh, for people here in the room to make notes uh, or to reference um, a little bit easier. And you can bring them up on the website uh, if you're uh, coming in via Zoom. We did run out of the packets in the front. They are making more in case people are interested. All right, I'm gonna stand up a little bit, just not be sitting behind the computer. So look to, First, give you an idea of where to officially comment, as well as uh, for those of you online to find the informational handouts that I'll be referencing throughout the presentation for people in the room here. Uh, our website, fwp.mt.gov, uh, scroll down a little bit on the homepage and where that red box is that I have highlighting, it's the 2022-2023 hunting regulation proposals. When you click on that, you'll come to this page, uh, proposed hunting regulation changes. It's got a schedule for some of the other regions. This is the last one here in region seven. Um, and it also says a public comment will be taken through January 21st, submitted online. So when you scroll down a little bit further on this page, you'll come to each species. Uh, we'll be discussing deer and elk here, statewide proposals, upland game bird and turkey proposals and migratory game bird and black bear. This one, uh, when you click on deer and elk, there'll be a drop down tab for all the different regions. This is showing the drop down tab for region seven. These are all the PDF documents that are in the handout here uh, for the folks in the room that you online can reference if need be. And this is also where you'll comment. So to give some brief history of how we got to the, where we are today, um, in mid to late summer, uh, we were given the directive uh, to take a look at our regulations and find out where we can simplify our regulations, uh, where they were biologically uh, relevant uh, based on biological guidance and numbers to simplify. Uh, come September 1st, we provided those proposals. They then went out for public vetting um, September 20th through October 20th. Um, from there, we prepared uh, those proposals for the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, then I'm sure some of you are aware on Monday, December 6th at 2 p.m., um, our director uh, emailed out some changes to the previous proposals. 
uh, primarily for elk districts that were 200% over objective. Uh, a week later, uh, before the Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting, uh, there was an additional change to some of those proposals. Um, and then proposals were then amended and approved from the Fish and Wildlife Commission, uh, the December 14th meeting for public comment, where we find ourselves now. Um, the public comment period was open December 16th. It was originally running to January 14th, but it's been extended to January 21st. We had a meeting last night in Glendive, the meeting here tonight, um, and then public comment going to the 21st of the month. We will then compile that and uh, put that in the commission packet for the Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting on February 4th, where they will choose to adopt, amend, um, or drop uh, any of the proposals that will go through tonight. And like Brad said, I'll be talking about some statewide proposals and uh, proposals specific here to Region 7. So going to where we started um, this whole process, different than any other year, uh, with that regulation simplification process. So here within the region, looking at our regulations and where we could simplify, we didn't do anything for mule deer, but we had one for white-tailed deer, and it was to eliminate the region-wide 007-01 white-tailed deer bee license. Uh, this was a second opportunity managed with a quota um, available over the counter to residents only. So with that change, we're looking to convert how the 007-00 white-tailed deer bee license, uh, which is currently unlimited, one per uh, hunter, to be changed to be based on the quota system. And looking at the biological justification, deer numbers, uh, licenses sold over the past couple of years, uh, we proposed a quota range with an initial quota of 8,500. Then we can look at the two elk proposals that came uh, from the region here, looking at hunting district 701, specifically a uh, portion of it in the Western section that required a 590-20, either sex permit or a 900-20, the archery bundle permit uh, to be managed there with the remainder of hunting district 701 uh, being a general elk unit. And then looking to dismantle the 900-20 uh, archery uh, bundle, elk bundle in 702, 704, 705, and make them managed underneath their own uh, LPT uh, 799-20 and having that with a quota range and an estimated uh, starting quota of 800. Looking at some of the statewide more or less questions uh, that came up through that process, uh, should elk and deer seasons begin earlier, later, or longer, um, or shorter, have more time between uh, archery and rifle, uh, two to three week antlerless season, um, also the question, if a hunter draws a limited bull elk permit, should they be restricted to only hunting that during the season that is valid? Um, should buck deer and bull elk permits be limited to first choice only? And then as well, turkey uh, season changes, uh, changing from the second Saturday in April uh, to the, running to the third uh, Sunday in May to just go to April 15th to May 31st. From that uh, regulation simplification process uh, here in region seven, uh, we got 56 total comments. Um, there were some duplications, some comments that were just blank. Um, we had some comments that were shared that weren't for any of the proposals on the table, but in all in all, um, there appeared to be six in favor and three opposed of the white-tailed deer bee license, which is some general confusion of how that quota system uh, would work as far as opportunity uh, occurs. Um, as far as splitting the 900 archery bundle from the 22 hunting districts and having 702, 704, 705 managed as their own archery permit with a quota, we had 21 comments that mentioned support and three that were opposed. Um, for 590, uh, or for that 701 part partition uh, that was managed under 590-20 and the 900-20 uh, permits, we had a few comments, they canceled each other out. Um, so based on that and some other work, we decided to move forward with the white-tailed deer bee license and the splitting of the 900 archery bundle to have 702, 704, 705 managed uh, with a quota underneath their own permit. In addition, this is in the packet. It's, you know, a lot of print here. Um, it's available online. Uh, we were asked uh, during that process to provide a one-page handout of why these elk uh, or any elk hunting district across the state for us at 700 and then 702, 704, 705, why these elk hunting districts that are over objective have limited either sex permits. Um, the biologists did a really good job breaking down um, application rates, harvest rates, uh, herd uh, demographic rates, uh, bull harvest, bull to cow uh, ratios. So I encourage you to look at that if you have any questions later on. 
or throughout this whole comment period and process, feel free to, to get in touch with myself, Brad, or any of the biologists. So now with that being said, we had gone through that. There was a lot of people that commented. We get the questions and calls still, you know, I commented already, do I need to comment again? That process is done. We are now, this is the biennial season setting process. So those comments um, were applicable during that, but now we're going into uh, the nuts and bolts of what actually the next two hunting seasons could look like. Well, we got the maps out there. Um, a lot of the regions were also looking at hunting district boundary changes. So I wanted to throw up the state map there. Uh, that's, that's available for view uh, on the website where you can comment as well. The reddish orange outline show hunting districts that are gonna have some kind of boundary change. As you can see here, when we look a little closer for region seven, we have no proposed hunting district boundary changes. Like I mentioned earlier, throughout this process uh, on December 6th, uh, public notice was sent out uh, detailing 14 hunting districts that were 200% or more over objective uh, and had some special criteria that was gonna change in eight of those hunting districts. Uh, those that were applicable to us here are 702, 704, 705. Zooming in on that, um, that's the portion there right in the middle that speaks to it. It would make a general elk license valid for either sex elk only on private land. And just to make it a little bit more clear and in bold language, um, general elk license valid for either sex elk on private land only. And then that 799-20 either sex elk permit would have been reduced by 50% from 225 currently to 115. Uh, that permit at that time during this uh, notice, um, those licenses would have been valid on public and private for the general elk only on private. There was a lot of, um, discussion, a lot of comments, a lot of calls that came in from that. So then, uh, as I spoke to earlier, there was a change then right prior to the December 14th commission meeting. So right now, as you can see uh, from the webpage, we'll be going through the deer and elk uh, portions of those. Uh, for each critter that we talk about in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, I'll have the box when you get to that page where you'll find this information and where you can comment. For those of you online, that box up there is not clickable. You cannot comment just clicking on that right there. But I wanted to show you the proposal that did move forward. Once again, is the Whitetail Deer B License 007-00. So can I jump in for a second, yes. Brett? I know this creates, um, speak yes. loud so the folks online can hear. We went through that previous history on the reg simplification stuff that we were assigned to do so that you understood where we got to. Where we are at now is all of that stuff that we went through in that first effort was put to the side. Here's where we are. These are the things that Brett's going to talk about now. This is what's sitting on the table. This is what the commission approved on December 14th. And this is what's up for comment right now. So if your comments come in and the commissioners look at that and say, we want to make a change on this, like Brett said, they can alter it. If they decide that they're going to leave it like it is, then that's what it'll be. So this... Everything he's talked to now is just some history so that you understand our process to now. From this point on is what you're commenting on. From this point on is what's critical. From this point on is what is out there right now that will stick if, if unless the commission looks at comments and is swayed one way or the other that, boy, we're seeing a lot of comments on such and such. Does that make sense to folks? Okay, sorry. Nope, nope, you're fine, thank you. That's just been a very confusing point for folks, and I understand that it's been a little bit of a challenging season. So I want to make that very clear that what we talk about from this point up is where we're going for this for the February fourth meeting. Yep, and it's good to reiterate that because we can view a lot of the comments as they come in, and there still are comments that are that are referring back to the regulation simplification portion as well as that December sixth public notice. So those are off the table. Um, different than, than what we're moving forward here with these season setting proposals. So uh, you change the whitetail deer B license 007-0 from unlimited one per hunter to a quota of 8,500 with a range of 1,000 to 12,000 um, to be able to move within that quota range uh, depending on you know population uh, ebbs and flows. And then the elimination of the whitetail deer, uh, white deer B license 007-01, which is the resident only with a quota of 2,000. Looking at the elk master list uh, for the portions that are applicable here to region seven. We have the unlimited antlerless elk B license. Or, so now 700, hunting district 700 has been looped in. 
Um, and with Commissioner Tabor's proposal, there's the unlimited antlerless elk B license 900-00 ballot on private land only during any open season. And then we look at hunting district 702, 704, 705, the addition of an either sex archery only permit with an unlimited license quota. Uh, that is for the archery permit. And then one thing that is incorrect uh, on our website that um, hasn't been updated yet, but it's still what is online, uh, but it falls underneath hunting district 702, 704, 705. It says to change the quota for the 700, which is applicable for hunting district 700 from 225 to 340. So I have that highlighted there in case somebody catches that in there. Um, and then also online underneath the deer and elk uh, comment portion, we have uh, what the deer and elk regulations would look like. So to show you, um, even though it is misrepresented in that previous list that's online, when you look at the regulations, the draft regulations that 700 permits still is maintained at 250 as it, as it historically has been. And then if we were to break out and just look at 702, I think 702, we see there is where the change has occurred on that 799-20, going from what was 225 to 340. Then again, for 702, 704, 705, the statewide unlimited antlerless LP license ballot on private land only. Um, in those hunting districts outlined there that were 200% or more over objective. In addition to the uh, adding of a late season for elk in 702, 704, 705 through February 15th on private land. With that is the extension of all valid B licenses in region seven to be eligible, plus that new statewide unlimited antlerless elk B license 900-00, as well as any valid general license for antlerless elk only. So that means that you'd have a multiple uh, suite of options to use during this late season, any unfilled B license, LB license, any unfilled general, as well as the over-the-counter unlimited LB license. Looking back to the elk master list, uh, there's some more kind of repetition, but some more um, information there. What we see here is applicable, once again, unbundling, on the left side of the screen, unbundling that 900-20 archery only either sex permit. And here we see for the 702, 704, 705, making that an unlimited archery permit. Um, going just below that for the rifle permits for 702, 704, 705, going from 225 to 340. And then on the right side of the screen, the addition of that unlimited antlerless B license on private land only for 700, 702, 704, and 705. Then some additional statewide proposals as far as permits where you can uh, proposal forward to be commented on. Permits for either sex elk or brow tying bull elk will limit the holder to hunting for antlered elk with, within only the designated hunting district for that period identified on the permit. So for example, if you held one of the unlimited, if everything were to go through and you held one of the unlimited 702, 704, 705 permits, you could only hunt bull elk down there. You could not go to a general area and hunt bull elk. You could still go to a general area where valid for antlerless harvest and harvest a cow, just not a bull. And then the late season antlerless elk option, um, late antlerless elk hunting as proposed in the master list for the hunting districts to run through February 15th shall be applied. So having the late season and uh, any additional B licenses that were valid for 702, seven, or inter-region seven would be valid in 702, 704, 705. Uh, Black Bear, um, statewide we are looking or proposing to eliminate the requirement that each harvested Black Bear needs to be physically inspected by a department employee and that successful hunters will be required to submit, submit a pre-molar from any Black Bear harvest and provide it to the department office within 10 days, either in person or by mail. And then specifically here for Region 7, uh, based off of legislation that came through from this last session, is to add hound hunting season to our Black Bear spring season with a quota specifically for the hound hunters of two in our entire black bear management and unit 700, which is all region seven. That is in addition to the four black bears um, quota um, that is not part of hound hunting spot and stock and everything like that. And then it would add hound training season from June 1st to June 15th in the entire uh, bear management unit 700.
uh, for non-resident home licenses as it's applicable here to region seven, there would be no more than seven available in the bear management even at 700. And uh, there's a lot here. There's another page of this as well. It, it goes into drawing for this non-residents uh, for black bears and hound hunting, um, how they get their money back if they're unsuccessful on drawing the rules, the age restrictions, um, classification of a non-resident. Uh, once again, a resident hunter with a valid black bear license may lawfully chase black bear in any valid hunting district management unit, period open to hunting. Uh, talking about re resident owned training licenses may pursue black bears with a dog or dogs during the training season at the end of the spring bear season uh, via, via some of the legislation that just came through. Uh, the training hours for it, what's prohibited um, as far as using dogs. And then moving into the upland game bird and turkey regulations, um, a few things that came through at just the spring turkey season dates um, from kind of the, the second and third Saturday to a, just a fixed date of April 15th to May 31st. Um, then what came through from the December 14th commission meeting, there's a proposal to allow the use of air rifles for fall harvest turkey. Um, 0.177 caliber has to be 1,250 feet per second or a 22 caliber um, has to be going 950 feet per second. Our currently our turkey boundaries uh, for region seven and region six, uh, they don't align with our administrative region boundaries. So the proposal is out there to have those aligned. So it's just the same region that you look at for all other species would be the same for turkey. Uh, going down to some more upland game bird, uh, once again, allowing for the, the air rifle as described for fall turkey, the same for upland game bird um, during the fall season for mountain grouse and then for migratory bird to establish a light goose conservation order for snow and Ross's geese in the central flyway, March 1st through May 15th. Okay, so kind of went through that. All those can be found um, underneath species specific uh, icons that I showed. Uh, now we've got a little bit more of the statewide proposals as far as it's related to quotas and season dates. So every biennial, every biennial season setting, we have to adjust the, or we have to adjust quotas or approve quotas. Uh, these are the quota ranges and the term quota um, for all the uh, deer, elk, and antelope uh, license and permit types that we have. So I've got a few highlighted here. Once again, uh, in this quota list, it still shows the 700-20 either sex rifle permit being adjusted to 340. Um, it, there, there has been no discussion about that. It should still say 250. That was just a clerical error. Uh, then when we look down to elk, there's that 799-20, which is the either sex rifle permit down in 702, 704, 705. That currently shows the quota of 115. That is still there from the December 6th public announcement for the reduction of 50%. And you've got the 799-21 archery either sex permit um, for 702, 704, 705 being unlimited. The statewide antlerless elk over the counter unlimited 900-00. And then on the bottom, our mule deer antlerless proposal uh, to have the 007-00 mule deer B license uh, have a quota range of 1,000 to 10, or sorry, whitetail, sorry, whitetail deer, um, to have a quota of 8,500 with a range of 1,000 to 10,000. A lot of stuff that we deal with um, still needs to be tracked and we still need to have quotas approved every two years for it. So here we have the game damage, the management season, the wildlife health, and the urban wildlife quota authorizations um, for region seven here, uh, 2000 for deer, 200 for elk, 500 for antelope. And it's just a blanket of five big one sheep across all uh, administrative regional uh, boundaries. And then special CWD hunts, uh, that's just statewide numbers as well as the urban wildlife <coughs> maximum harvest quota. So for a lot of the um, special CWD sampling that we need to do, and for a lot of the uh, urban uh, game or urban uh, hunts that we have in, in small towns around here. Um, in the statewide proposals, you will see the proposed 2022 season dates and the 2023 uh, 2023 season dates um, as listed. 
one thing that was not underneath the Upland Game Bird tab for comment that came from the December 14th commission meeting that I'll highlight here is the extension for pheasant, partridge, mountain grouse, and sharp-tailed grouse to run uh, to January 31st. Currently, uh, they all run uh, to January 1st, so this would extend them for another month. So to comment on that portion, you would go to the statewide proposals and the proposed season dates, because it is not listed underneath up game birds. Once again, how to officially comment, you know, or, um, to have conversations, provide information, uh, but no official comments will be collected here. Your, your way to comment is to go to fwp.mt.gov, go to the 2022-2023 hunting regulation proposal. You'll get to that page, you'll scroll down. And from there, you can choose um, any of the species that you wanna provide comments for, as well as statewide proposals. Once again, this is just the example of showing the drop down for region seven uh, underneath the deer and elk comment portion. You fill in your name, contact information, and your comment there. Um, I really recommend for them to be, you know, articulate your point very well. Um, and just, you know, be factual to the point, you know, carry your emotions as you need to, but just make sure that your comment we can we can understand what you're talking to and, and what you what you would like to see changed, maintained, uh, what have you. And with that, I'm wondering, Brett, on this if we shouldn't uh, because to maintain some flow with online room, I wonder if we should instead of just opening to general questions, if we shouldn't maybe go by species first, okay. and then you know talk about elk in the room, talk about elk online. Talk about deer in the room. Talk, does that make sense to folks? And that kind of keeps it consistent. And then general questions at the end, and then open up if you've missed anything. Does that work for folks? Yeah. I'm just trying to maintain some order here. So, um, and obviously, everything is clear as mud. Um, so, with questions, we can go back um, to That's the applicable slides that you may in have. The room, folks. Or, yep. Okay. Start here. So, I'm wondering if we shouldn't start with. We've got online folks that are listening to this, and hopefully, we've heard all of this. Um, let's talk. Let's start with elk questions in the room, and we'll do the best to answer those. The purpose of this, of course, is to get you as educated as possible, so you can make cognizant comments, questions, etc., to the commission, so that they have that in their package as they deliberate these changes that have been proposed here. We threw a lot of stuff at you, um, and so I'd kind of like to go by species. So if there's any confusion, we can kind of pull it back up again, read through that language and, and make it clear. Does that work for folks? Okay, where do we want to start? First, first hand up, we'll go from there. Elk. Sir. On your uh, slide, you said the archery only tags for the seven or three, four, or five are then they stay unlimited. Now, can the person put in for them as the second or third choice then? Yes, the question was, and it's, I'm going to repeat the question so folks online can hear it. The gentleman in the audience asked, with, with 702, 4, and 5 being um, a limited entry, but with no quota on top of it, it's, it's an unlimited number that can apply for this. Does that then allow folks to get that tag as a second or third choice, which I think is correct? Yes, they would be able to do that. There isn't a cap on that. So there is no non-resident um, limitation, the 10% limitation by statute because it's unlimited. Um, what that allows you to do or allows our statistics folks to do is be able to track how many people have put in for that tag. It's not just a general tag that you don't have a concept of who's there hunting it. You'd still have to apply for it. So we'd know there was 1,000 or 10,000 that put in for that tag. Does that make sense? Okay, other questions on elk? Matt. So, uh... Does that mean you sacrifice your bonus points if you get it as a second choice? <laughs> Not as a second or third choice. Okay. So Matt asked, does that mean that you sacrifice your bonus points for online folks? Brett says not as a second or third choice. I'm glad you knew. Mm -hmm. Sir. Say in there it says that uh, in a 702, 4, and 5, your last population status would be able to put about 2,000 head out. When was that changed? The last gentleman asked our last population survey 
estimated about 2,000 head of elk on the herd unit 270245. He asked when that when that survey was conducted. That would have been last winter. So last winter. So just to add a little more reply. Steve, come stand over here so folks can hear, please. Steve, the biologist is going to address this further. And yeah, what was the question? Sorry, can you repeat the, the, the question? The question was, when was the survey last done for 7024 and 5 on elk? That Brett answered that that was last year. And then, then there was some concern about, did we see all those elk in essence? So Steve's going to talk to that. So yeah, we fly the biologist and I had a Ryan DeVore out of Broadus. We alternate years. So this year I'm flying 702. Last year, Ryan flew 704 and 05. Um, we fly every other year. Tells us what we need to, but also pilot availability is challenging. But to answer your question, no, we can't count all the elk. I mean, we fly the good available habitat in the areas we know that there's a, a core population. And that gives us our, our, our ratios, bold cows, calves, things like that. Those are minimum counts. And if you're asking specifically, and those are minimum counts. And if you're asking specifically where in 702, 704, 705, Sarpy for 702. And then um, Ryan, if you want to uh, unmute yourself or have Marla unmute yourself and talk specifically where you fly in 704 to 705. Sure. This is Ryan DeVore, the biologist out of Broadus. For the 704 area, we cover uh, essentially between the Powder River and the Otter Creek drainage uh, from east to west and from Wyoming uh, all the way up to Highway 212. And then in 705, we cover the Long Pines area, um, which would be southeast of Ekalaka. And these, in, bio, in, in ungulate biology, you're not doing complete censuses. You're not getting in a, you know, a total count of X amount of elk. Um, these, are, these are trend surveys that happen over years so that you can see what those trends are doing, up, down. And then as Steve mentioned, you get herd dynamics, you know, bull to cow ratios, calf to cow ratios, those types of things. Those are the statistics that give you a concept of whether that population is doing this or doing this, going up or going down. I can't do hand motions for folks online, I guess. So, okay, question over here. sir. So in your guys' uh, justification documents, you guys talk about the number of 900-20 permit holdings in Hunt and Street District has increased by more than 50% between 2014 and 2020. How do you guys get estimate that data since um, that would be, I mean, I've never been, is that from the, I guess, expanded on that? The, the question, and, hope, and correct me if I'm wrong, the question that came from the uh, gentleman was in 702, 4, and 5 on elk archery, up to, to this point, our, our use estimates are claiming, what did you say, 2,000? said a 50% increase between 2014 and 2020. A 50% increase between 14 and 20, which is about 2,000 hunters. So, um, and how do we get that information? You want to answer that yeah. one? In when they do the hunter harvest survey calls, they ask what time you spent most of your time in the hunting district or where you may have harvested an elk. And then that gets classified via that hunting district. Okay. So that so gives it's us- off the, It's off the phone call. Right? Correct, that gives us the rough estimate. And then, yeah, and then it's gonna have to be some statistics though. Correct. Right, right. Sir. I'd like to go uh, just a question on the elk objective. I believe it's at 500. Correct. How was that established, number one? And number two, maybe it's time that we revisit it before we make some drastic changes. Yes, the question and comment from the gentleman was, where in the elk plan did this, did our elk objective for 702, 4, and 5 come from? What, what number is it? How did it get there? Is that correct? Yep. Okay, to answer that, that plan was built, was published in 2005. Uh, the work to do that plan started in 2001 through 2003, somewhere in there. At that point in time in our history, south of the interstate in 702, 4, and 5, um, our elk numbers, as I talked to some of the landowners down there, they started seeing elk from mid-90s to late 90s. That's when they first started to run into more than just an occasional one. So there's a, only about five or six years in there from the time those elk were first started to be seen to when that objective was set. At the time, that objective was set in a plan. That plan was built to help kind of give basic guidelines to us as managers to be able to move that population forward with this biological, social, and political ramifications that, in, that are 
always around elk. Um, so that's that was a starting point. We, we didn't know. Um, brand new population, and that's very rare. Where do you find a brand new population of elk in North America? Well, there it was. You know, these elk were starting to expand. And if you think about where these elk were in Lewis and Clark's time, they covered this country. Well, that changed a lot, hasn't it, since then until 30, 20, 30 years ago. So here we sit now with this new population that's starting. What do we do with this? You know, what is the social tolerance going to be for these elk? What is their carrying capacity? How much can, how many elk can this land carry? Um, we still don't know the answers to that. What we do know is that those elk started and established and started to grow as far as population size. So our manager at the time had to have a starting point. What is a good objective? Well, when you're seeing a handful here and a handful there, 500 sounds like a lot of elk. So that's what we picked. Well, now 15 years later, that's, or 20 years later, that's not near enough, you know? So, so here we sit probably closer to 3000 elk down in that country, 2,500 to 3000 elk with a 500 quota. So is that quota valid? We've had these discussions internally, not, not really, but by law, um, there was a law passed in 15, um, that said that made the, that mandated that the department manage to objective. So here we sit now with this objective that's in this elk plan that now we are legislatively driven to, to get to. So when you talk to folks and say, whether it's landowners, outfitters, sportsmen, anybody, is 500 where we want to be? We always hear no, that's not where we want to be. So where you're getting at, sir, and you're very valid, is, is that a valid objective? Well, for us to manage, it's really not. But that by law, that's where we're at. So what does that mean? Where do we go with that? Right now, concurrently, there's we started our elk plan revision. Um, and so that elk plan revision is probably going to dive into that in the next two years and decide where where is that magic number. And that's based on hunter tolerance, social tolerance, landowner tolerance, a variety of things, habitat capacity, et cetera. So I, I guarantee you that you'll see that number change in the next couple of years as that, as that revision comes along. But in the meantime, as we go through these regs processes, here we are tied to that. Um, so that's kind of the catch-22 that we're in as an agency. Does that answer your question? Do we have any uh, number of landowner complaints the last several years? That is a good question. We had that last night as well. Um, and if I can remember what Ryan answered on that one. It varies by year, but anywhere from two to five a year. Yeah. Like 702, 704, 705. Yeah. Sir. Sure. I want to highlight, so... The elk management plan for 702, 704, 705 on page 391 says when valid repeatable surveys are established, the objective numbers should be reviewed. You guys now have those flights you just talked about. Why have we not um, updated the objective? His question is that in the elk plan documentation, it says that when we have um, repeatable flights that we should we're directed in that plan to then review those objectives. Why has that not been done? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, it's just been the last few years that we've had those repeatable flights. You know, we've done one here, one there. And the, what has it been, Steve, five years? 16. Yeah, from 16 on, we've been able to kind of replicate that every other year. So we're, we're getting a consistent trend information on that. So now when they've come open and said, we'd like to revisit this elk plan, th there's our opportunity to dive into that is where it is. Unfortunately, it just coincides with with this regulation process and a lot of turmoil that's that, that we're discussing today with that as well. So, other questions on elk? Well, it seems like what he just said gives you guys a little more justification to not get hung with the current management plan objectives, right? Kent Kent's question is. It's not really a question. Or comment. It, it, yeah. It, it seems like it gives you guys a little bit more flexibility to not be hung. And you also have a back management, right? So Kent says the management plan in the language we just discussed should give the agency's management ability a little more flexibility to follow that. Um, we also have, an, as, as Kent just mentioned, um, we have an adaptive management har or management program, which is what this plan dictates. You are correct in that. At the same time, um, we now sit with, with commission approved objectives that are, you know, uh, regulation changes that are now before us that we need to comment on. So 
what you know for us as a manager yes I, I think there is some flexibility there when you get to the actual process I don't have a lot of flexibility there so this is where if you've recognized that as a member of the public that that's a concern to you I would really refer you back to sell that to the commission get on there and and write your comment down and say just what you said the elk plan says this the managers say this this is what we're seeing in these regulations and what I'm if I'm hearing you correctly that doesn't mesh so then give your suggestions as to how to make that work. That, that's what the commissioners need to hear. Uh, him and then you, sorry. Uh, so when we, what year was the 900 tag established and why was, what was the concern that, why we put it under a pool net? If I remember that, I think it was under crowding. I mean, I, I, for the record, I opposed it back then. I strongly don't now. I can't, I can't remember. You guys remember the year that we went to that bundled unit? I don't, it doesn't stick in my head. Um, there was a, there was a large public interaction and that's, I think that's when the breaks went to limited entry because there was a lot of, a lot of social intolerance for the crowding that was up there. And so there was a real demand for that. So we ended up with, you know, commission action there, put, put limitations. And, and because people were concerned about being excluded from their areas, if I remember correctly too, has been enough years that that bundled unit came into existence. Uh, that program worked very well for 15 years it's there. Um, where it started, the wheels started to come off on that, especially for us in region seven is all of a sudden we shot two record book bulls down here. And, and you see that hunter, the numbers you create talked about all of a sudden shifted here. So when we were, when we were asked to do this regulation simplification process, um, that's one thing we asked the biologists and, and our director asked the biologists, look at that biology. What can you sustain and what can't you sustain? That was the, why we gave you the, the prehistory on this, what we did in July, August, September. We proposed as a region then that we needed to be um, limited entry with a quota on top of it. Now, since then, the director's prerogative, which is by law, it's there. He has that ability to come out and say, we're going to try something different. Director's prerogative was to leave that structure the same, but take the cap off of it. You can see the obvious differences and challenges with that. And I would, I would again, encourage you to comment on those things so that the commission know what your thoughts are on that. Young man, sorry. My, my question is, is like pertains to that exact discussion is, is so ultimately is our weight in the comment more than your guys' as an office professional in setting this policy? The process and I, so the question was, does the weight as a public comment carry more than what the biologist's work has has vetted to to date? Um, I, I, that's an apples and oranges type comment um, or or evaluation, I would say. And I'll go back to the process itself. This is a little different than we've seen in years past, and and there's a good reason for it. Um, we've had an election. We've got we've got a different. Uh, set of commissioners. We've got a different director and governor. Um, for, for many, many years, we had a very stable commission that kind of walked through time. And we, we learned to dance, so to speak, with that commission. We've got a new commission now that looks at this a little bit differently. It's not wrong. It's just differently. Um, so the process is that we come forward with what we think needs to be done biologically. Um, and that's what we did with our reg simplification. Then we went out to you as a public and said, how does this mesh socially? Um, and we got comments back and Brett talked about those, you know, there was strong response on that. You know, if we want to use 7045 elk archery, strong response for that with a cap on it. Um, then that goes to the Helena office and, and the director and his staff can look at that and decide whether they want to keep that and move it forward to the commission, make some changes and for, move it forward to the commission, which is what happened. Uh, the director's office said, we're going to make some alterations here. and We're going to move it forward, which is the current proposal we're looking at now. Then the commission deliberates that and then they pass that for public comment. So now you, here you are with public comment. We've had our shot. So to answer your question is that we've had our shot. We've thrown that out there. Here's the process in its, in its, all its glory, so to speak. So your comments at this point really do carry a lot of weight to be quite honest. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I was just kind of curious at the end of it. It's like, you're good. It's explained your opportunity was there and seeing it. Yeah, we're not excluded on this. As, as we're at the first step, and they, when the director's office says we want to do regulation changes, you get out there, you look at your data, you look at your check station data, you talk to your landowners, you talk to your sports persons, you know, you gather everything you can, and you come back to us with what those suspected or what you propose as needed changes. 
and, and for the most part, that machinery moves along fairly smooth. Every once in a while, you get something like you referred to, the Brakes Elk Archery. That was a big issue 15 years ago. Uh, and that swayed that from an open system to a limited entry system. Um, and there was a lot of controversy over that one at the time. Um, but th that's where it went. And it went, then it went through that administrative process with the commission. That, that's where we are today with the same stuff. You know, there's, there's proposals that are out there that are, that are, have woken people up and they're looking at that going, do we like this or do we not? And that's your comments at this point really carry a, a lot of weight, honestly. One more here and then I better go to online. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll be done after that. So just a, a, maybe to the biologist, a quick question. Um, just curious if we increase bull harvest, would that ultimately decrease the population of elk? The question was if we increase bull harvest, will that reduce the population of elk? And, and I'll make <laughs> and Steve Steve's moving over to answer here. Yeah, no, no, not in my opinion. Uh, we've actually in the region been uh, trying to manage towards objective both populations. So we went pretty liberal um, for antlerless harvest, and then we've tried to to balance the bull harvest to stay within the stated objectives in our management plan, and and we're a little on the high end, so. Yeah, we can maybe take a few more bulls, but we're 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 within that range, within the management plan. So, okay, now, we come back, but I I don't want to. We've had a lot of conversation here with folks been muted on the outside, so let's let's open this up. We see Liz McFarland and then Paul Ellis. Let's listen to those two folks first. Liz, hang on. Okay, so I I have a rather long statement and, and questions that are associated with it. But my statement, I think gets to, I believe, some of the heart of the problems and challenges that we're talking about this evening. And, you know, the first general comment is, I, you know, this whole thing, I uh, it has been fraught with the cart before the horse. And what I mean by that is, um, I think in, um, Region 7 came up with a very reasonable plan um, that you shared in October. And then since then, that's been um, gerrymandered, I suppose, is how I feel about it. And we came back with yet another plan to this uh, um, lengthy and now very, very confusing process. But the whole basis of that should have been built around having an elk plan revision in which to make substantial and substantive changes. And without that, everything's just kind of uh, shooting shooting in the dark. And, and so I just want to go back and first commend Region 7 on the proposal that they shared with the CAC in, in um, October that I felt was very much in line with dealing with the current um, elk management numbers um, and, and recognizing that there were um, issues there, but trying to deal with that without trying to blow up the whole thing. And on that point, I, I just would like to say, I, I, I was here when those numbers um, were set at 500. And as you said, um, you know, there was a place to start and it was a very low number and everybody knew that. And so the basis of having that low number or any number for that matter, and particularly in a region that I understand is, um, I think the number is 80% um, private land. So the basis of change in that number has to be around private land tolerance. And I'm not saying exclusively, but that's gonna be a big piece of how, the, how that's reflected in, in licensing and quotas and, and timeframes. And so my understanding is that, you know, somewhere in the last five or so years, there has not been much or any uh, call for elk depredation uh, hunts or um, requests for uh, support with elk. Um, so there's this feedback loop that just isn't happening. And, 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 and in fact, it's just, it's, it's, it's not there. So I, I just wanted to point that out. And then I, I, I think if, um, if Commissioner Lane is in the audience, I, you know, I understand it, 
are, I hear that he's received some uh, subsequently, you know, people raising their hand and saying, oh yeah, well, we do have elk problems. Well, really, or is that just tied to a, the proposal that came out of the, um, the, the Helena office? You know, it's just, it's just, it's just really questionable. So the other thing, I guess, with that question is, you know, I really have problems with the math and justification of this new proposal that we're looking at, as I did with the proposal that came out of the, um, the director's office, not the region seven proposal, but the director's office proposal, and now the secondary one. But again, you know, the math doesn't add up to the justification. It just, it's just totally off. I mean, you know, it's kind of the proverbial, where's the beef? Well, where is it? How do the proposals that have been put forth relate to our situation in region seven? And I don't think they do. And not only that, I don't think they relate to good biology and or the um, biological information that's been put forward um, by the folks in region seven. And which also leads me to my third point is I, I think it's just appalling to bundle up, and we've heard that word tonight, we've unbundled some stuff, which I think is very good, but to bundle region seven up with other regions as the commission, as the director did, um, you know, and say that we're all ubiquitous, we all have the same circumstances, we all have the same ratios of private land to public land is nonsensical. And I really believe that the commissioners should look at each region for the uniqueness, um, the private land versus public land and other issues that are unique to that region. And stop, please stop putting us all under one generic region or, uh, multi, or statewide or multi-region scenario. It's just not, it just, it just doesn't add up. And so I have many other comments um, that I'd, I'd share, but I, I really think that, um, you know, that moving ahead with the proposal as it is right now around elk without having a current elk revision completed is just fraught with all sorts of um, messiness and um, mistakes. Anyway, I'll stop on that piece. Thank you. Hey, Liz, thank you. And you have some well thought out comments and concerns. And I, again, would, would refer you back to the online ability. There's, there's this place where Brett told, you know, you, click, you can click on those species. And, and there's also, if you look at the top of that page, there's an email. If you have a, if you have a larger email or, or letter that you'd like to send, that more, little, has more items that are all, in, all inclusive, so to speak, like you've just talked about, I would, again, uh, encourage you to, to to send those comments in so the commission sees those. Thank you. Let, let's talk to Paul next. Could I, could I just, could I, before Paul jumps in, could I just say one other thing is I, you know, I'm, I'm, my husband and I are private landowners. We manage uh, some other property that's fairly large. And, you know, I don't want to have or be pitted against and, and um, public land hunters. And so much of what came out of the director's office and yet this subsequent proposal that's come out of the, that the commissioners moved forward really pits, pits public land hunters to private landowners. And I would, I would just challenge the commission to look at ways to modify that. It, it I, you know, I don't wanna have a bunch of people lined up at my front gate in a big doggone Congo line pounding to get on our property with the proposal that's in front of us around elk. I, I shouldn't be harassed like that. I shouldn't be forced to be harassed like that. But at the same time, I would understand the absolute you know, annoyance of public land hunters with what's been proposed. Anyway, I will be commenting in depth and I appreciate your time in letting me speak my piece. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Paul, we'll put you on next year. Can you hear us, Paul? 
got him going. There, now, can you hear me now? We can, yep. Oh, sorry. Um, I want to move up to 700-21 uh, archery up there. Um, I'm wondering why we didn't have any proposals for any changes there because that hunting district, and I agree that, I mean, the, the uh, objective numbers there are ridiculously low, but that area has a lot of elk in it. I think it's at 681% over objective. But uh, with that being said, uh, I'm just wondering why we didn't address that as far as, um, you know, doing something different there as far as uh, limiting, going to a limited permit. Um, you, I can answer that right now, Paul. Is that, or do you want to go on to something else? No, you, you can like answer to that question. I've got okay. more to it. More, there's more to it, but go ahead. Yeah, while, while we're fresh, I'll answer them as we go if I can. Okay. Um, the reason that we didn't propose anything on that is when we were asked to send our original proposals in by the director, what we, we, we felt that we were in balance in 700 as far as both either sex rifle and either sex archery and cow permits, et cetera. Our, our population there, we're harvesting about the same amount of cows as we're recruiting as far as calves go. So we're very stable in that population and have been for quite a few years now. Um, we're, we're kind of bumping up against the edges of both hunter and landowner tolerance. So the, all those matrices tell us that we're kind of in the sweet spot there. The reason it wasn't proposed by us is because what we were asked to do is look at your biology, tell us what needs to be changed, and we did. What we felt needed to be changed was the 70345 stuff that needed to be split out and have a quota on it. And then, and then the reason that was included and, and, and not 701 with the director's information, I cannot answer that was his uh, move to, and his prerogative to say these units will be part of this new proposal and he did not include 700 in that. That's, that's as good as I can answer that one. Okay, well, and I'm just curious because I mean, over the years you've taken a lot of uh, non-residents out of that area and a lot of money out of the, uh, the economy up there, millions of dollars over these years. Um, uh, there's the other thing is that according to your figures, there's a 16% non-participation rate for archery elk hunters in that. So there's a lot of these guys that are getting the tag up there and not even hunting it. Um, uh, and it's taking away opportunities from, and this year was the first year residents couldn't draw that first. Not everybody drew it first choice. So um, I, I strongly suggest we go back and follow the adopted elk management plan for that. There's a lot of land up there. There's a lot of elk up there. And the other thing is, is that, you know, there's a lot of public land that people have access to. It's, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of land with, with elk on it that, that's not privately owned up there. Um, and the other thing is, I looked at your biannual season setting quota ranges. You don't have a quota range for 700-21. For so I, you know, they, I know why they did it. They locked it in. They didn't want the, the department moving away from that 705 number you had. But in 2010, you guys went from, uh, from 820 because there were too many non-residents drawing that tag and they dropped it down to 600 and then they moved it back up to 705. That's not very many people, not very many people on the ground hunting there. And are you proposing, um, for first, second, and third choice for that 700-21 in, in your in your rate. I mean, I think it's been, what has it been first and second choice before? Uh, I think it's always been first, second, or third choice, has it not? So, yeah, my guys are nodding yes, Paul. Oh, okay. Well, I think that, I, I, think, I think the quota could sure go up. Archery is not doing you're not going to get much, uh, you're talking about balance and stabilization, you know, you're not going to get that kind of a, a, a increase in harvest and stuff with archery hunters, are you? Well, the way, where we're currently sitting with, with limits, with quota limits on those, um, the percentage of elk harvest by, by both archers and rifle hunters are about the same based on there's a lot more archery hunters out there than there are rifle hunters, but they're, you know, 15% success with archery, 30% with rifle. When you look at the numbers of tags that we let, it ends up being about the same in general for both. 
And then when you look at the bull to cow ratio, we're on the lower end, sometimes below the management objective, sometimes right at it or just slightly above. So there are biological implications to adding hunters out there and increasing harvest. Okay, well, I would I would still like to see you guys adjust that. And you know that my my comments will reflect that. Okay, do you have, do you have other, not, other points you wanna make on elk, Paul? Not on elk, no. Okay, thank you. We'll circle thank back you. around when we get to the next species. I apologize for this being so arduous, but this is about as good as I can wade through it here, folks. So who's next, Marla? Uh, we have Brett Barney. Mr. Barney, are you available? I am, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, so I'm the wildlife manager for Sunlight Ranch in region 702. I have approximately you know, a little over 100,000 acres out there. And I just, I guess I have some comments and some questions, but um, I'm not, we certainly have elk on our property. I certainly don't believe that we have enough elk that, that it would warrant a, sol a, sol a soldier season. Um, so the, and the, the next, but the question I have is, um, I'd like to understand a little bit about the 900 uh, elk B license. Um, so it's my understanding that the that they 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 try to do away with the that other 900 tag, whatever that number was. Um, and so they added this in for, so basically you can hunt in two, four, five, six, and seven um, for an antlerless elk but i don't you know if you can buy that tag and hunt anywhere you want in the in that part of the state how, how do you know how's that what, what is that accomplishing i guess ryan has his hand up. okay have, let's have ryan answer that ryan he's not there all right, well, I'll take a stab at it and maybe we can get Ryan on here or Brett can help me with this. Um, that, that extra 900 B tag was a proposal that, that came from uh, Commissioner Tabor and it was based, I think, if I'm correct, on any unit that was 200% over objective could then have this additional cow harvest opportunity. Um, and as Brett described, in, in as we currently sit in 7024 and 5, you can kill a cow on a on a general tag, you can kill a cow on the forest cow tag, you can kill a cow on the 007 cow tag, and now this would be a fourth opportunity to buy a cow tag. Um, and I think the purpose, and I, and I can't speak for Commissioner Tabor, but I think what he was looking at is if we're over objective, how do we get this down? Let's provide more of those cow hunting opportunities. Does that answer your question, Brett? It answers my question, but I, I you know, it, it would seem to me if you want to. I think the question was, is, is, is people are buying a tag for to go hunt in, to, you know, they want to hunt in their backyard during the week and then they want to come out to region seven on the weekends. And so, you know, if this, this tag is out there and available, I, you know, what, what are we taking away? You know, what, what are we doing to eliminate that problem of, of just having everybody from the entire state just come on out to region seven and hunt? If, if we're trying to identify what the what the problem is and how to fix it, it would seem to me that we would, you know, if you want to if you want to add more tags to a region, we should do that. And if we're not selling those tags, we should find out why we're not selling those tags and address the problem. I'm not sure that adding an unlimited number of tags to, you know, the every every region of the state except for one um what, what do we how are we identifying what the problem is yeah i can't answer that for you i, I think you have very valid comments and, and i would suggest that you submit those to the commissioners and, and maybe in that form ask them ask them to consider that okay thank you i i agree i absolutely agree with the archery tag that um the archery antler tag that, that it's uh, that we have that specifically for the region that you draw it for. I think that's I think what you guys are doing are excellent. I, I appreciate everything you guys are doing. Um, I, I don't I don't particularly like the shoulder season 
Um, and I, um, this 900 tags kind of got me a little confused, but thanks again. And thank you for the opportunity. Now, Brad, I, I would all thank you. appreciate your comments. And I would, you know, because we're having to kind of rifle through this quickly, I, I would refer you back to, I know you visit with Steve Atwood, your local biologist. I would have you visit with he or Brad or I, you know, on the side too, if we want to further uh, flesh this out too. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Who's next, Marla? Go to John Poole. John Poole, are you available? Mr. Poole. Yeah, this is uh, a group at Cold Strip. Okay. Uh, we're at the clinic. John Poole's our uh, official from the clinic here. Uh, we have several questions a couple of people here that we'd like to ask so I wouldn't my name is Wayne Dudley I'm here at this meeting and watching this I would like to ask why district 700 only has two meetings that one this one we're at tonight and one in Glendive all the other districts one through six have at least five meetings to get a good uh, uh, input from all the people in different areas. 700 district is a large geographical area. Why are we limited to only two meetings? That is a good question. And it's come about um, through history is what it is, is that we just haven't had the staff or the ability or the time to cover everything that we'd like to cover. And so we picked Mile City and Glendive uh, as being our closest locations and everybody unfortunately has to travel unless you live here has to travel about 85 miles to get to one of those meetings so in the future we'd like to see more we'd like to be able to spread out but we the capacity is just where we're at at this point the second question i'm daryl bravick second question i've got is a lot of our elk numbers and problems are due to access um, we have, as you know, a large area of outfitters, and as soon as hunting season is over, the elk and stuff are migrating out of those areas with less pressure and down on to other farms and ranchers. How, how, how are any of these proposals looking to assist in that? Hello? No, we, we heard you. I'm just trying to think this one through. Okay. <laughs> those are good questions. And again, I would refer you back to sending those to the commission. Um, the, the question of access is one that we bounce around a lot. Um, we're, we're instructed pretty specifically to look at that biology and what works there and allow, allow the public process to determine allocation of these tags, access, who gets them, how, et cetera. It's always been a real wrestle and always will be in wildlife management, to be quite honest. So those are good questions to pose to the commission is how do these proposed regulations uh, impact us as far as access is concerned. And then going back to the previous question about uh, public meetings, Steve and I will be in Cold Strip at the Cold Strip Sportsman uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. No. The seventh? Correct. Okay. The seventh? This Thursday. Okay. It will be Thursday, correct? Six. Yep, the sixth at seven. Okay. <laughs> at the Catholic Church. Thursday, the sixth at seven o'clock at the Catholic Church. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> Other questions, folks, from Cold Strip? I think that's it for now. We'll catch those guys at the Colster meeting. Okay, we appreciate you tuning in. Thank you very much for that and for your comments. Who's next, Marla? Andrew Wright. Andrew. Andrew's a CAC member. Can you hear us, Andrew? There, I heard something. <laughs> yeah. Um electronics um <laughs> so uh, i got some questions with the 900 cow tag as well you you say it it goes to region or it goes to 702 704 705 but it also is good in in region 700 
yet you said that you're doing good on objectives up there. Correct. So why was why was it issued in the 700 district if if they didn't switch anything else? Because that came uh, from Commissioner Tabor. That was his proposal. Uh, the proposal that was thrown out by the commission on this for public consumption is just that, is if you're 200% over objective, this would be an additional cow opportunity. So you're correct. That would, for region, for hunting district 700, that would apply as well. So that would be an additional cow harvest opportunity. Um, if you're asking, do we feel that that has some, do we have some concerns with that biologically? Yes, we feel that that can increase our harvest to be quite honest. And we don't know that we need that at this point. What level would that be at? We don't know. Thank you. Um, Other questions, Andrew? Um, I guess that's about all I got um, for that. I, I was just trying to get some clarification on that. Okay, ho hopefully we answered your question and you can now provide a comment to the commission and say, these are my concerns with this. Does that make sense to you? Yep, I, I've, I've heard a lot of other comments. There's some good, good stuff here. I want to thank everybody. Okay, thank, thank you, Andrew. Who's next, Marla? Justin Schaff, I yep. apologize if that's not Justin, correct. are you there? Uh, we'll have your now, now, now try it. <laughs> Justin, are you there? All right, I think I just unmuted myself. There we go. There we go. Thank you. I have two questions. And uh, first of all, thank you for uh, creating this venue for people to join from out of Mile City. Um, first of all, could you speak to the process that it came about on the original proposals from Region 7 that went to Helena and came back looking much differently? Is that a case of people, bureaucrats in Helena, think that they know how to manage elk better than <clears throat> Eastern Montanans do. I think you're trying to get me fired, Justin. <laughs> I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier. That, that process has always been the same. Um, it's just a little more tumultuous this time. The, the process is that we're asked by our director to come forward with what we think needs to change as far as those regulations go. We call those tentatives. We throw that out there in that December meeting. Um, and we did that. We, we made those proposals. We went through that process as directed. We had public comment on it. Usually we have a scoping session and then we provide those. This year we went through this reg simplification process and there, that was our effort. Um, so, so there were our proposed changes for this year. Um, then it's the director's prerogative to look at those and decide, is this where we want to stay or do we want to try something different? Uh, and the director chose to try something different. And then the proposals you, you know, his, his December 6th, and then what was the next date? The 14th changes are, are they weren't just willy nilly. There were things that he had thought through with his staff, with the commission, et cetera. Um, and, and as I've talked with director Warshik, it's, it's to get folks to pay attention to where we're at, um, to come and do this, to pub publicly comment, to be part of the process. Um, other than that, I can't speak for him. He has to speak for himself on that. I, I don't know what other motivators might be there, but that's that's what we've talked about one on one. So, and that that is his prerogative as a director to throw those changes out there, and 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 vet them to the public. So that's where we sit today. Does that answer your question? Yes, that does. Um, that kind of leads into my second question, and. I think, you know, trying something different, and I don't know if I'd necessarily think this is anything different. I think this is similar to what we kind of fixed back in 2008 with the brakes um, archery and the, uh, I guess, the conglomeration of elk that we have found on private land. And Brett, you know, I guess kind of worked through some of that in the post effects. And uh, I am curious, do you guys have concerns that giving everyone and their dog a cow tag would affect the 2005 management plan that calls for 30 to 40 bulls in 702, 704, 705. The, we were asked to put justifications together as to why we have limited entry 
in, in both 700, 70245. Those are online and you'll, you'll find them under some of the same stuff. Um, and the reason we were asked that is to, to articulate that biology. And we were limited to one page, so you, can, you have to pack a lot into one page. There's a ton that you could put in there. Um, and, and you're correct. There, you, know, you add more harvest, you're going to have some challenges with those population demographics. You know, where, where does that balance? How do we do that? That's, that's why that justification is out there. And I would refer you back to that to read that stuff. Um, as, as you poise your, your comments for the commission. And if you have further questions on that, don't hesitate to call Brett, myself, Steve, whomever, um, and we can help walk through what, what we see as maybe some potential concerns. Mm -hmm. The challenge with some of that is, is you don't know, you know when, it's, when it's regulated and you have a quota cap on it, you can kind of turn that valve. When it's not there, you don't know what kind of pressure you're gonna see or if that pressure will shift. It makes it a little bit harder to make those determinations as a biologist. Um, I guess kind of piggyback on that, and this might be more direct towards a biologist, but do you guys envision a scenario where increasing the either sex archery permits would exacerbate this issue? Um, you, I mean, even according to Quinn Kujula, Increase, and this is talking about the breaks that we had. Increased archery hunter numbers caused ripple effects that splashed beyond conflicts over individual animals. Growing hunting pressure on public land pushed elk onto private property. That made the animals off limits for many archers. It has also made them harder to reach during the general rifle season, when unlike the archery season, tags were limited. I guess what I'm curious about is, is this going to make the problem worse um, in your guys' opinion? Based on situations in the breaks, which I think that reference uh, kind of comes from, there is, you know, every system is different, but there definitely is that potential here. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. Anyone else online, Marla? We've got Don. Let me. Okay, Don, are you up? Are you there? We are. Okay, perfect. My name's Don Feaster. Uh, I'm up in the 700 area, um, west of the Muscle Shell, north of Highway 200. And my concern with the, uh, the general cow tag uh, proposal is we had an extreme amount of pressure this year during the rifle season, specifically on the weekends, as Brent Barney mentioned, um, the guys will hunt locally near their homes during the week, but they hit the brakes area really hard on the weekends. Um, we've had more conflict with uh, public hunting versus private land rights. Uh, this past year, we actually got the fish and game involved on a couple uh, citations this year because it got so extreme. Um, we understand the population is high. and We want to help every way we can, but we also want to protect our private property rights. Um, the other problem we've seen, not only were the, the wild game being pressured, but so is our livestock, um, which starts a whole nother can of worms for, for me as a rancher. Um, so I, I really have concerns about the general tag where anybody and everybody can just pack up for the weekend and, and show up. And on stage road this year, the, the campers look like there's a carnival going on. Um, so I'm, I'm not really in favor of the open tag for, for our area. Um, it is overpopulated as far as population elk goes. We didn't typically allow hunting. We are allowing hunting this year, uh, limited hunting. And actually last year, we, we had a total of 30 hunters on the last two years. Um, unfortunately, not everybody can shoot. So if they're just shooting in the air, they're really not reducing the elk population. But... Uh, I just want to put a comment on there that I, I've had some concerns with the, the hunting pressure with the, the new regulations on that general tag for cows. Thank you, Don. You've, you've articulated some very solid concerns um, and I appreciate you doing that in this public forum, but it, it will be lost if you don't go back to our webpage and, and at least put those things in a written form so the rest, so all seven commissioners can see that. So I would highly encourage you to do so, please. Thank you. I will do so. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, Marla. We've got Rich. Rich, are you there? 
I am, I think. Yep, you are. Well, I just, I just have one question and, and then a little backup after that. But And it was kind of hit just recently. But do you feel that the unlimited archery permit and the additional 799-20 rifle permits, is that going to add a lot of hunting pressure to hunt District 705, which is already just getting pounded by, by hunters here on, at least on the public ground. So what we originally proposed as Brett described was that we pull that out of that bundled unit, which was 23 units that people could move anywhere in the state and hunt archery. 702, four and five was part of that. We felt we needed to remove that and put a quota on its own so that we could regulate that a little tighter because of hunting pressure. So what you see proposed now is that that structure stays the same, but there is no cap on it. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I know what's going to happen. And that's what's scary. It's already, you know, there isn't a lot of, how do I say this? In, in that district, 705, yeah, there's quite a bit of public ground, very little that hold elk. And it's already just pounded by hunters relentlessly through archery and rifle season. And then, uh, you know, my comment on that is if they do up, you know, up those rifle permits, that's another bunch of bulls going to get killed there. And then unlimited archery, who knows what's going to happen with that, but it's going to put a ton of pressure on the bull elk population. It's pretty simple. If you want to reduce the herd, take more cows, and that could include a December season. And the reason I bring that December season up, and I don't know this for sure, but I just had a sneaky feeling that if there was a December season for cow elk, some of the private landowners might be okay with that. And they might say, yes, have Adam. That's all I had to say. Thank you guys. Okay. I appreciate your comments, sir. And again, I would refer you back to our webpage so that you can type those. So all seven commissioners hear this. I'll Thank do that. You. Thank you. Um, if we, I don't want to do repeats. We'll go back around the room. So if there's. Uh, we did have that one anonymous question that. Okay. When I. Something was typed. typed. It, it disappeared. Okay. So do you know what it was? I don't recall offhand. If you could ask who posted in the question and answer box anonymously, if they want to repeat that question, if they mind doing that. Yeah. If, if you did type a question in here and it hasn't been answered, would you type it again, Marla? Can't find it. So I think what I'll do is go back to our room again. If, is there any other questions here, folks, on elk before I move to the next species? Yes, sir. And, and this is just a really quick one. I, but you guys always keep talking about it, and the press releases keep talking about science based approaches. What overall in 702, 704, 705, what is the science in the proposal as it is? I mean, so. What are we addressing? I'm trying to understand what are we addressing by increasing the rifle permits and increasing, you know, you're gonna we're gonna increase the bolt that's with the whole structure you just moved on. So what what is the science? I mean, what's the science? I don't get it. The science is what's in that write-up as far as what the biologists were asked to submit for yeah. justifications. That's the science. Yeah, but then why the proposal that's on the table now. It came from the director's office, and and for whatever reasons they made that proposal. Now, whether there's a blend of science and politics, I don't know, but that that's a question that I would have you ask. Okay. Yeah. Bill, I just want to when the December six proposal came out, it caught everybody off guard, including us as commissioners. And so then when we met on the 13th of December, we told the directors that this, this isn't gonna work. And so then we came up with this modified plan, which is what the current proposal is. And I still know that it's not perfect for our region. And that is why this is so important to hear this. We still have the opportunity to change it to fit the 700 district. And that's what I told the planner, not the 700, the seven, region seven. So we plan on, or I plan on taking everybody's comments and developing what makes sense for our area. Because I, I personally don't agree with everything that's in the current proposal myself. 
So that's why I want to just reiterate, it is so important for you to make these comments. And I appreciate hearing what you've said tonight. So please write those comments because we do look at them. And you're, it's not falling on deaf ears. So because we do, I need to know what, what we need to do with the UP7 and then I'll make those necessary changes at the meeting in February. So thank you guys for your comments. And, and like I say, it, it's not going on her. Thank you, Bill. To, to move us along now, last call on elk comments and then i'm going to move us to deer so is there anything else that we haven't talked about any questions you still have sir on that when they had the december 6th ones and they were breaking apart the private the public land or the, it shouldn't be you know maybe you say for service like it used to be with the cow tax where it's just not blocking for service property for service was there i know there was a bunch of blowback that why i mean when 75 80 percent of the elk are on private land they got a differentiator tag somehow because otherwise it's making everybody that's something on the forest look like every, there's everybody hunting 80 percent of the hunters hunt 20 percent of the elk and then 20 percent of the hunters hunt 80 percent of the elk back kind of get some type of balance there yeah we always wrestle with that you know when you're when you're looking at a region that's 80 percent private ground um and we we depend on those private landowners to sustain our herds here and our opportunities here, but that also dictates somewhat limited access. That makes it very challenging. So the places that you do have access can get overrun at times, and we've seen that the last few years. So it's a little bit of a challenge for us to find that balance with some of it. The, the December 6th proposal that the director threw out there was an attempt to look at some of that. It wasn't well received as from the public. There was a pretty big groundswell. So then he's come up with, there's been some other ideas since then. So I don't have a magic bullet answer for that. It's something that we've worked on for 20 years and we'll work on for another 20 years as we try and create that balance in there as far as population stability and, and how do you allocate that for folks? You know, that's a, it's a tough one that commissioners are, we're, we're up against it trying to manage that resource and commissioners are up against it trying to put that out in some sort of policy. Would it be, what would be the difference if they was to make 702 the ready area? apply for a 702 tag, apply for a 704 or 705 to break them areas because that would help dramatically. There's a lot of models and if that's something that's in your mind that you think is a good solution, I would suggest you submit that as a comment as well and say here's here's one opportunity. And put a cap so. on the number of archery tags. You gotta have a cap on it or otherwise uh, every outfit is gonna have every buddy, every piece of land tied up and be able to yeah, there's a lot of details in this, isn't there? <laughs> in every one of these things, pull one thread. Poof. <laughs> I think they're having a little bit of a hard time hearing online. With okay. The last okay. Point. Yeah, I haven't been repeating Good back. Name. Okay. Um, are we ready to move off of elk and onto deer now? Oh. Beat, beat us to death. Did you find we your did. question? Okay. No, we did have the uh, five people who were, yes, at as a matter of fact, they did repeat it, but we also had the five people calling in. I don't know if um, we let them know that they hit star six, they can unmute okay. themselves if they do have. Yep, thank you, Marla. So that, that gives, we have folks on the phone too. So if you hit star six, if you have a question and we can, we can help you there. Otherwise we'll move on to deer. And we appreciate your patience, folks. This is a grind. Come back to this. Here's our question. What is the rationale for making some of the unbundled 900 archery units either general or unlimited? That's a proposal that came from our director's office, and I don't have the justification for that. That's something they'd have to explain. Okay. Deer, we good? All right. Thanks for hanging in there with us so far. Yeah. If you need to pee or vacate, please do. Thanks for coming, you guys. We did have hands up for Rich and John Poole and, oh, no, they're still up. So I don't know if they had additional. Right. Well, let's go around the room for deer and if they do, we'll add it okay. at the end, so. And Brett just up. Okay, and any questions on our proposed deer? What we proposed in the region, again, just to remind you is we had a, and I apologize for taking over here. Is we, had a, we had two whitetail tags originally. Um, one was a general tag that anybody could buy, B tags. These are just B tags. The other one was 2,000 
um, resident only opportunity tags. You know, you had to choose your region. Um, as we went through this reduction in, in regulations process, that was one thing that was, was given to us very succinctly is that this is too many lines, you could reduce that down to one. So what we're proposing is essentially how we manage mule deer does. Um, so it's one tag um, you put in for that, there's a quota on top of it. If there's surplus, you can buy up to seven. So it actually increases your opportunities as long as we have surplus, which we always seem to have with, with whitetail. So, so does that make some sense to you where we went with that? Any questions on that? Any questions about deer, about that proposal specifically? You might have other questions about deer, but that's the proposal I want to talk about first, and then we can answer other questions. Okay, wearing you out. I can see it. Online, is there any questions online about deer? About our Let's deer proposal? Check with the... Okay, go through the list that have hands up. All right. John Poole again, the Coal Strip Group. Questions from the Coal Strip Group still? We're playing with the computer. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so are we. We but get it. The, the question we've got on upcoming deer populations is affected by your number of elk tags that you pr propose. Uh, the forest area gets inundated with hunters that come down. They've got an elk tag and they bring four or five guys with them to go chase that elk. And our elk or our deer populations in the forest region are just being decimated. I would have you submit that proposal or that comment. Um, that's that's not one of our proposals, but it's valid concerns. And I think you need to submit that and then have your visit with your biologists on Thursday when you get to see them as well. We will. Thank you. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> was that it from the Coal Strip group? Yeah, okay. thanks. Thanks, folks. Um, let's try Brad again. Is he on there? Yep. And Paul. Thanks. Um, I, don't, I don't really have any questions about what, what you're doing in Region 7. I think that's great. I think one of the things that uh, um, one of our hunters brought to my attention was is that in some of the regions in the western part of the state, they're talking about um, sh shutting that season down like three weeks earlier. Um, and what effect is that going to have on our region? Um, you know, having, it, having that... Uh, that hunt uh, a little longer and I know you probably can't answer that question but I think it's something that we need to think about um, you know if we're going to do something we should probably standardize it across the state or we're going to get in we're just going to have more problems with with deer hunting yeah Brad I think what you're talking about is is something that we've have discussed you know if if the western side of the state goes to a three-week season and we have a five-week season we're definitely going to see more hunters show up here for those last two weeks. So it is something that I think is a valid concern. And I, I again, I would ask that you propose that as a, as a concern to the commission to review, please. Thank you. Who's next? Paul. Paul. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Paul. Go ahead. Just some quick notes. Uh, I agree with Brad on, I, I'd be a little concerned about that too. Um, I know we've tossed around maybe uh, choose your region. Um, that might be an option for that. I, one thing I am hearing from some of the landowners that are in block management, in just different places, they're seeing a lot of uh, people out there hunting deer and only one of them has a buck tag and the other four, three or four have just doe tags. So I think, I think the overcrowding, some of this is coming from resident and non-residents that are just that are hunting does also. It's just a, a thought. And I guess, you know, um, at the December 14th meeting, um, Region 7 said our, our mule deer were stable. I, uh, the, I don't agree with that. I mean, I've, I've been on, I've been hunting out there for 40 years and I, you know, the deer are just slowly and slowly declining. And I don't, and I'm not especially, I know this is a drought year, but we're just over the last few years, we're just not seeing that the mule deer that we used to have at all. So that's all I've got, thanks. All right, thank you, Paul. Other questions online? We're there. All right, um, 
How about upland birds? Let's hit that in the room here first. Now, remember the proposal changes were? To extend pheasant, mountain grouse, and sharp tailed grouse from January 1st to January 31st, and then for the use of air rifles for mountain grouse in the fall and turkey in the fall. Questions on, on that that we can help answer for you so you can craft good, solid comments to the commission. That was a, a those, both of those were submitted by Commissioner Tabor, and I don't know that uh, was an explained justification at the commission meeting on December 14th. They were just proposed and thrown to the public for comments. So, so if you have concerns about that, Kent, it's or thoughts or ideas, I would submit them so that, especially so Commissioner Tabor can see that it's you know his proposal, he needs to hear that feedback. So Okay, uh, any questions online? Uh, T. Renner. Okay, let's let's hear. Um, is there any biological concerns with extending the the bird season another thirty days? Because by my thoughts, you got one hundred and twenty days for grouse, partridge, mountain grouse, and we've got about eighty some days on pheasants. If we get into January, where all the habitats covered in a foot or two of snow. Wouldn't that be extremely detrimental to the populations and it wouldn't really, I, I, you know, it, it, it would be detrimental to the populations. And I really don't know of how many hunters would take advantage of that. How many bird hunters want to go trudge through two, three feet of snow to go harvest a few birds. And then third, um, I, I personally feel extending the season another month would be detrimental to landowner relations. It's usually by the end of December, when you call up and you ask for permission or you stop out, you get, oh, God, yeah, yeah, one last time. Uh, yeah, I suppose, you know, they're just, <laughs> they're, they're tired of seeing our faces by the end of December. So I don't, I think extending the season another month would be detrimental. But are there any biological concerns of extending it a month? There, there's not a lot of literature on um, late season hunting and additional mortality as a sort of comp compensatory or additive. Um, states that have seasons that run later are in different latitudes, different ecosystem types um, start later uh, than ours here. Um, there definitely is the potential um, for increased harvest to start having a detrimental impact. Um, it's one thing that we're reviewing now um, with most upland game bird uh, species and populations, you usually try to keep your annual harvest right around that 10% or less, because that's usually where the compensatory versus the additive trade-off is. Um, so looking at our harvest rates, our survey population rates, trying to dig up the limited research and literature that there is there. Uh, but as of right now, uh, we're still working in that process, but there is that potential. Does that help, okay. sir? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, and I again, I would suggest you have some good points to, to be made there that you submit those online so that the commissioners can see them, please. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. We have Rich again. Okay, let's talk to Rich. Hi, yeah, uh, this is Rich again. Yeah, I kind of got skipped over. I got to jump back to the deer. Hopefully you won't mind, but pretty That's quick. Fine. It's a pretty quick question. How... How many mule deer doe tags can a resident or non-resident buy right now, you know, today with today's uh, rules and regulations in place? Seven. You can buy a combination of seven doe tags, whitetail or mule deer. So that okay. comes down that, to guys, I, I, that's just utterly ridiculous. When I drive by a deer camp and I see eight or 10 mule deer does hanging there, and then they take them to the donate. I have nothing against people donating meat, but these things, they're just out there killing them. And it's just wrong when the population is just tumbling and we continue to allow it to happen. I, that's not really a question. Yeah. That's more of a comment. So anyway, you answered my question. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. And Rich, I think that is in statute, if I'm not mistaking it. You guys know? Um, so that's something that would have to be changed legislatively. There is, we do have some statistics on how many folks buy multiple tags and actually shoot and fill all those multiple tags. And it's, it's actually a lot less than people think, but, but your comments 
need to be submitted as well. Yeah, I think there's I think there's less being taken because there's less deer now. So um, I may be wrong, but uh, thank you for your uh, thank you for your answers, guys. Thank you, sir. Who else do we have? Uh, we have Liz. Liz, we'll open Liz up here. Liz. Oops. Hi again. Hey, uh, d just back to the birds for a moment, the upland bird and the, and the extension of that um, season. So I'm just, you know, I, I think I'm not sure who, who, it was, who was talking um, from your shop there, but it seems like there's rather limited understanding about what the extension might do biologically. But on to that, I'm just curious, is there any thought with kind of um, the recent or more recent weather patterns that we've been having, you know, with uh, extensive and extreme drought um, therefore cover is reduced and that kind of thing, how that might play into an extended season for upland bird? That was my question. Okay, so, so I get it correctly, how, what kind of impact an extended season might have following a, a drought year or where habitat is limited or, or negatively impacted with? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we all know that we've been having some um, challenging weather last more than the last couple of years. And so, but let's just see, just look at the drought piece of it. We've been having multiple years of drought, at least out here. So the question is, um, is there any thought around from a biological perspective, how those conditions along with an extended season could would, could that be detrimental to those populations more than your, I think you said 10% or less harvest? Right, so, so weather, weather characteristics and variables are gonna have the most impact on any wildlife species. Um, and for, for most upland game bird species, you, know, you will be able to see them rebound as long as habitat um, quality uh, increases with normal precip, you know, average winters and stuff like that, they can rebound. Uh, within two to three years based on brood size and, and uh, uh, survival. Sage growths are a little bit unique, but they're not a part of this, but I'll speak to that. They're what we call a lag species. So you might see their, their decline a few years later and it might persist a little bit longer. But uh, yeah, there is, there is the, the potential for that temporal period of, of multiple years that when you compound, compound drought habitat um, issues and extended harvest and extended seasons, um, to see populations decline or remain lower and not rebound as fast. And I'll go back, yep, no problem. And I'll go back to uh, kind of the point or question that Rich had. Uh, we ran some, some numbers for a number of 007-03, uh, the mule deer bee licenses purchased per person this past hunting season. So uh, based on mule deer surveys, uh, we reduced the quota um, from what, what is stated in the regulations down to 5,500. So for those 5,500 bee licenses, we had about 4,200 people purchase them uh, with the bulk uh, approximately 90%, 92% uh, of those uh, either holding one or two. Uh, we had 17 total people hold seven uh, licenses, 14 hold six, uh, 41 hold five. So you really, 91, 92% of your license holders only have one or two B license. So, so just to clarify, when you guys say it's protected by statute, you're saying they can purchase up to seven, but if the quota hits, they can't. Right, if there's not that surplus right. there, yeah. they only right. have one or two. That, that part, that part. Yeah, right. Okay, we got Online Dawn. still, Dawn. Are you with us, Don? There he is. Are you there? Yep. Yep. I just want to step back to the deer real quick, if you don't mind. Um, some of the concerns with the, the population um, being tough in some of the areas where it was big drought. Um, you know, one thing I've always had concerns with is hunting the mule deer bucks during the rut. Um, it, it seems to me that we're pulling the best breeding stock, if you will, during the most vulnerable times for those bigger bucks. And I don't know if a consideration would be to move the season 
you know, a little bit earlier and, and maybe just use half the rut or, and I know it changes season to season, but um, I, I think hunting the, those big bucks during the rut makes it uh, pretty vulnerable for those guys. I don't know if there'd be any consideration there. Maybe I'm, you know, half cracked on that one, but just wanted to throw the comment out. Yeah, Don, and that was one of the questions that was posed uh, during the regulation simplification portion. And uh, similar to what we see um, in surveys that we conduct every 10 or so years, uh, people, uh, it, was, it was well favored that people like the five week season, the structure as it is right now. Um, the majority of the responses were in that sense. It was asked to go earlier, run later, have a bigger gap, shorter. Um, the majority of respondents said that the five week season as is where it's set in the fall structure um, was what they preferred. Are all those comments available? You don't have them online, but you can request them. That, yeah, that survey that he's referring to, we that's a social survey that we've done twice in the last 20 years. The social survey, I think in 2011. Yeah. So the, the comments from um, that is available. Isn't available because you could do a mediated request for them, but uh, the, the social uh, survey from 2011 is online on our website. So. Anyone else online? Hey, we have Carol Condon on the birds as well. Okay. Carol, are you with us? Go ahead, Carol, if you're there. If you're having problems, you can also type your question in the chat box. Meanwhile, we've yeah, oh, we had Don or sorry, Justin again. Okay, am I on? Yep. Um, I guess I my I would uh, I got more of a comment than a question on the upland proposal. Um. It sure seems like there's a lot of uncertainty on this proposal. And I, I understand that this, this proposal came from one handwritten letter to the commission asking for an extension of the pheasant season. Then it was expanded on all upland bird. Uh, you know, we don't know how this will look on bird harvest. We don't know how this will look on hunter landowner relations. And, you know, it's not lost on me that we just went through the driest year on record and now we're, you know, in a pretty heck of a cold snap for this winter. And so I guess, I guess I'm commenting more towards commissioner lane that's in the audience that uh, this is certainly getting the cart before the horse on, on this proposal that, you know, there, there's a lot of questions left unanswered. And if, if we move forward with this, there should be some studies done on the consequences of this decision. And that's, I guess that's all I have to comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Justin. All right, did you get Carol's comments by chance? Uh, let me swing back to her. Carol, if you're on, can you click your unmute? Or can you type your question in the chat box for us? For some reason, we're not able to hear you. Okay, keep trying to catch Carol. I'm going to keep us moving so these folks can go home. Um, let's let's visit about bears. Any concerns or comments about bears with the proposals that Brett lined out there? By we had legislative law passed this year that dictates that we need to allow for dog uh, hound hound hunting of bears. So that's what's been included in these proposals and is on the it's on the table to for for comment at this point. I have a couple questions. Well, Carol's probably still trying to talk to us about birds, but Rich, can you hear us, Rich? Yeah, yep. You there? Yes, yep. go ahead. I, I got a really quick question on the dogs. Is that gonna be for spring season and fall or, or just fall with the, with the dogs only? Or are they the dogs chasing bear? Yeah, it's just for the spring season. Oh, it's only in the spring season. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. 
Okay, we still have Carol. Carol, can you press your mute or oh? Okay, we're looking at a comment here. So Carol Conan to everyone, but to Commissioner Lane, you see the effects of the drought and the limited food and cover here. No one knows what this winter will bring. I hope the powers that be will allow the biologists to do their job and do the right thing for this precious resource, our game birds. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, and we apologize that we can't get you up to hear your voice. That's, I don't know what the glitch is there, but. All right, um, have we missed anything? Wow. I'm getting woozy too. Right. So. <laughs> Okay, I, just just to conclude, folks. First, thank you very much for enduring this. This has been a I've done this for thirty years, um, and this is probably one of the most tumultuous regulation setting seasons that I've been through. Um, so, thanks for bearing with us. Um, I'll give you a little my little parting shot, which is the same thing. Um, the question was asked back here. You know, you guys biologists, you know, don't you have that influence compared to us as the as the public? <laughs> The reality is with our public trust doctrine and the way things are lined up these days, and it's not just here, it's all over. You still have the opportunity in Montana to protect the resources the way you feel they should be protected by commenting. If, if you throw up your hands and say, and I've heard this from a lot of my friends that why should I even try? And I went a little bit because it's like, I get it. I get that you, you feel beat down on some of these things. If you do not comment, Wayne Gretzky, I'm a hockey player, and Wayne grew up in Canada. Wayne Gretzky said you, you score zero on every shot you don't take. It makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if, if you're going to make goals, you got to shoot the puck. So here we are. If you're going to have influence, you got to submit those questions or, and those comments. And, and I plead with you to do so. Um, in years past in my career, it's been such that we've had more autonomy at the field level to have more influence over this stuff our world isn't that way anymore. Things have changed a lot. Um, you're, what you're seeing here, and we've heard it in a couple of places, the commission has that capacity and that authority. They need to be educated as much as they can to make solid, sound decisions. This, this poor man came into this a couple of weeks ago, you know, a month or so, and is doing his darn best to try and listen to all these things, create some balance, um, and, and, and kind of hear all the voices. And they come from all aspects, honestly. So your voice is important. Um, and, and everybody has a different opinion. You know, we should be managing this wildlife for this reason, you know, and everybody has a personal opinion for my reason, etc. But when you blend that all together, we've been fairly successful. If no one's happy, we're successful kind of thing. Uh, it's a joke we say amongst ourselves. Um, the reality is, is when that gets out of balance is when we have real problems. And that's, you know, we've seen a little bit of that in this cycle. And that's why people have shown up in fat in force. And I'm grateful to see it. It means that in Montana, we're still participating. Um, I came from Utah originally years ago, and their system collapsed because people quit participating, honestly. And one side or the other prevailed at that point in time. We can't have that. We, we've got to have con this continual <coughs> tug and pull to make this work. So that's my little soapbox is just to push you back to this and say, it's one thing to come to these meetings and I truly appreciate it to have your voice heard amongst your peers. But if you go home and go there, I did it. You've done nothing after tonight. If you don't type that in and say, commissioners, all seven of you, this is my thoughts and my concerns and my opinion for my part of this resource. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. The same thing happens and it's not in this process, but the same thing happens at the legislature. Um, you're seeing more and more where the legislature is coming out and saying, we're going to pass this law and that restricts us to something, you know, um, the more the commission can deal with those problems and those challenges, the less we see that in the legislature, to be quite frank. Um, and, and, and a good example of that is shoulder seasons. When we, when we implemented shoulder seasons, it's highly controversial and is to this day, it's been 10 years, you know, and lots of controversy. If we hadn't done something like that, the committee, the, legislature is ready to do this and mandate it by law, then we're really stuck. Then we don't have any flexibility. So, so that's the process. And it's, it's, it's ugly and messy at times, but it, it is very inclusive in Montana um, compared to other states. And it's what's allowed us to keep our public resources the way they have been. So I highly encourage you to stay engaged in this stuff. If you have questions as you're, as you're mulling this over, as you go home with this package, 
as you look online and see what we've got proposed here, um, again, those comments are due by the 21st of January. The, the commission gives them enough time to kind of digest all this and then they make those final decisions on the 4th. Um, so there's opportunities there to still have your voice heard and to be an influence. Does that make sense? Are we good? One more. Okay. Pellet guns. Oh. Does anybody have any comments? Any comments on pellet guns? Yeah. The least of our worries. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure everything was it. Okay. Thank you again, Commissioner. Can I just make this you bet. Comment? You bet. Um, with the way this whole process works, I hear what you guys are saying, and I can represent Region 7. But like Brad had said, unless you guys put your comments out there, the other commissioners don't hear your concerns. And that's no more than I can tell Region 3 what needs to happen. Because I don't know what happens in Region Three, so that's why this whole process it needs to it needs to happen, and the only way for it to work is for you guys to comment. And I will do my best to represent your your thoughts and your comments, but it's so important that the rest of the commissioners hear this. We know that there's never going to be the perfect solution to any of this, but we are here to try and come up with what we think will work the best. Yeah, there's gonna be flaws, but that's why we address it every year to hopefully find out what we can do to fix it. What we've done, does it work? If it doesn't, we readdress it. So thank you all for your questions. And like I say, I'll do my best to represent you and help. Thanks, Commissioner Lane. Here, here we sit, folks. We've got a room full of folks. We've got a blogosphere full of folks. Again, we appreciate your comments. If, if you have concerns or questions or ideas or anything between now and the 21st or even after that, don't hesitate to call any of our staff here. Uh, we'll do our best to help answer those questions as best we can so, so that you're prepared to provide the best comments. I would also encourage you to tune in to that February 4th meeting. And if you get on our webpage, it'll show you how to do that. You can be a participant sitting in front of your computer on YouTube, just like these folks have done tonight. Um, so as these guys are deliberating as a commission and going, well, we think this, and they talk about elk, you can, you can line up and cue yourself and say, I wanna, I wanna provide a comment to that commission on the fourth, because some of these things as Bill talked about, Commissioner Lane talked about, how that process works is if we throw a tentative out there and there's no changes, that's what they vote on. There's public comment, they make a vote. Um, there is no public comment on that if there's no changes. If there's a change in that process, um, we've thrown, there's a proposal out there, 702, 4, and 5. Here's how our elk is going to be structured. If there's changes that occur at that February 4th meeting, someone proposes that we make it something different, put a cap on it, do something different, then there's public comment again. So that's where you need to apply yourself again. That's another opportunity, not only to question here, but to have your voice heard at that meeting as well. So, and, and that's a little more restrictive because there's the whole state. So the chairman, the commission chair, uh, Robinson will limit you to 30 seconds, two minutes. So have your, have your thoughts articulate and blast it out there kind of thing. So, but, and but please participate. If you're commenting via Zoom for the commission meeting, you have to- Register, register a day before, day yeah. yeah. Yeah, so pay attention to that. That meeting is February 4th, so kind of start watching that webpage. If you have questions, call Aaron, call any of us. We'll help you with that. We good? So we okay. have a couple of folks online just saying thank you, Commissioner Lane, for volunteering your time, and thank you for your efforts. Uh, T. Renner and Carol Condon wanted to bash that on. Okay. Thank Thanks, folks. Thank yeah. Yeah, we appreciate you showing up. And you close coal strip guys, we'll send our fresh meat down there for Thursday. You'll be, <laughs> you'll be ready.